Uh, in this series, it'll be a four-part series, and today, the real premise of today's teaching is seeing the future. You and I, um, whether we recognize it or not, the family as we know it has drastically changed over the last 50 years. And the question is, what will it look, back, look like in 50 more years? <clears throat> will we have a biblical basis of what family is? Will we live marriage out the way God intended it? Will our children know what a godly family is? Will they be able to articulate it? Will we be able to even sustain the biblical principles laid out for what a family is? And with today's teaching, what I want to help us do is recognize that what we do today, how we live now, will determine the next 30 years. I was 19 years old, fresh out of Bible school, I was on staff at a mega church. I'll never forget the moment it hit me. I'm going to be married one day, and I'm going to have kids, and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I decided right then and there that I was going to learn before I ever had a wife, I was going to learn how to be a good husband. I was going to learn what it was it going to take. Because I was doing all this counseling as, a, as an assistant youth pastor. I was doing all these counseling. And I'm like, man, these families are good families. And they're messed up. They're better than me. And if they're messed up, I'm in trouble. And so every time our pastor from that point forward did a family series, anytime they had a family conference, anytime they had a marriage conference, I was sitting in the middle of that as a single guy taking notes. And the reason that was is because I wanted to know what I needed to be and what I needed to do so that the future could be right. There's a key passage for today's teaching. It's found in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. In this passage, it's a listing of different groups there in this time in Israel. And it mentions, it says in verse 32, the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. They understood the times and knew what Israel should do. It's going through a list of this group, this tribal group, this family group did this, and this family group was good about this. But when it gets to the men of Issachar or the, or the people of Issachar, that group, that family group, it says these guys had special understanding. They understood the times that they were living in and they knew what Israel should do. In other words, they had insight. They could foresee they could project what's coming and how we should do what right would be and what right would look like and i'll tell you nothing more than uh, 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 no other place in all of our lives is more under attack than today our families our marriages what is really a marriage what can it look like what should it be like families uh, and all the difficulties that we go through and trying to teach our kids biblical principles and to live by a standard by which god set in place we are completely under attack and what we decide today what we do today will determine 20, 30 years from now. And it says that the men of Issachar, they understood it. They understood the time they were living in. And they knew what needed to be done. And my prayer and my desire for you and your family is that you would understand our times and that you would know what to do, what we should do, what's the right way. There's a lot of confusion on what's the right way. How should we go? How should we live? And so what I want to do today is I want to look at if you will, one of the premier characters in Scripture. I want to look at David, King David. And David, as we know, is one of the probably top five, if you will, men of God in the Holy Scriptures. He is a shepherd boy of a tribe, of the lowest tribe, if you will. God picks him to be the next king of Israel. And he's, as a young man, has a heart after God. We find him watching the sheep, which is the dirtiest job. Nobody wants to do it. God anoints him as king. Saul, the present king, hates him when he finds out literally that this kid is anointed. And he begins to chase him, try to kill him. David runs and hides. And we see this whole journey point of, of literally living in caves and hiding out. And then God actually actually brings about that completion of that. David ends up becoming king. He brings the kingdom together because they're all split up all over the place. He defeats all the enemies of Israel. He sets up, you know, a place where there can be night and day worship and prayer before God. He sets up the city of David on a, on a high mountainside uh, a cliff area to where it's protected. And man, the, the Bible says that under David's reign that Israel experienced a peace and a joy and prosperity like they had never experienced before. It's magnificent. It's magnificent, this man's life. In fact, he wrote most, most of the book of Psalms, which is a collection of songs and poetry written to God. It's magnificent, the book of Psalms, and he wrote most of that. A phenomenal man of God. And although David was a great man of God, and although David was a great warrior, and although David was a great king, David wasn't a very good dad. In fact, 
We're going to open up today reading towards the end of his life. The kingdom is set. There's peace. There's prosperity. He's fought off all the forces of evil. He's overcome the, 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 uh, Saul trying to kill him. And here he is later in life. And he should be in his, if you will, his golden years. Enjoying the prosperity of all that he's worked for. And we find him in a moment where he's fleeing from his, for his life from his very own son, Absalom. Everybody say Absalom. Absalom. Say it one more time, Absalom. Absalom. And so Absalom is actually David's third son. Now David's got multiple wives, so he has children with multiple wives. And so let's pick up, if you will, in this moment in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13, as Absalom is trying to kill and overthrow his own father. It says, a messenger came and told David, verse 13, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, exclamation mark, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. My kid's going to kill all of us. What type of little hellion do you have that's going to kill me, his mama, his sisters and brothers, and all the people that have been with me all these years? Flee, we must go now. We must leave immediately, for he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin upon us and put the city to the sword. David's saying, look, we got to get out of here. And so if you'll keep following that past description, now, this, this whole storyline covers about six chapters of the Bible. I thought you would, you would love me more if I didn't read every one of, every one of those verses. But I just kind of take you through the storyline. So I'll throw them up on the screen so you know I'm not lying. But at the same time, I'm not going to read it all, and I'm just going to kind of take you through the storyline. So in this moment, it's, towards the, it's in his golden years, his adult son, who probably at this point has grandkids, has decided to overthrow his father. He's decided to kill his father, and David, in this scene, is running for his life. The king, the man of God, God's man. I mean, he's referred to as the man after God's own heart. He is actually, all throughout Scripture, referred to even as the light of Israel, and, 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 and literally an image of who Jesus is going to be one day. That literally is kind of who David is. He's the guy. He is the man. And here he is fleeing from his life from his own son, Absalom. I would imagine that 50, 60 years earlier, however old Ab Absalom is in this moment, 40 years earlier, as that, that boy was born and laid into the night, as a father does sometimes, is standing over his crib, mom's finally passed out, the kids finally shut up and went to sleep, and he's standing over that crib and looking down into the eyes of that little baby who's sleeping, excuse me, into the, uh, the closed eyelids and looking down at him going, oh, I love you, buddy, but I know 40 years from now you're going to be a little jerk and try to kill me. I would imagine that he didn't have that as a mental picture of what this little blessing is going to be one day. Are you with me? In fact, Absalom, his name means the father of peace. They named this kid Peace. They named him that because that was his, that was his attributes. That seemed to be what this kid was. And I would imagine of all the kids, he's the one that slept through the night. Oh, he's so peaceful. Oh, we're going to name him Absalom, which means the father. He's going to bring peace to everywhere he goes. I would imagine probably as a young kid, he, he was peaceful and so forth and so forth. Probably as a teenager, even as a young adult, as a young married couple, he was a man of peace. But something shifted. Something shifted for this man to now want to murder his father, overthrow his kingdom, and set himself as the king. In fact, I can't even read the pieces of what he did violently, pervertedly with David's concubines and wives. Well, we'll just leave that alone. But this man has lost his mind, and David is fleeing for his life from this man. So I want to back up and say, let's figure out the family drama and what has happened over the years to get to this point. So if you will, back up with me in the book of Samuel chapter 13, 2 Samuel, chapter 13, and there's another moment which David's oldest son, Amnon. Say Amnon with me, Amnon. Amnon is David's oldest son, and in chapter 13, Amnon has a problem. He is the number one prince. David's got other kids, he's got other wives, and he's got all kinds of kids. He's got sons that are little princes running around too, and Amnon is the oldest, thereby heir apparent to the, to the throne. Amnon obviously is a spoiled brat. He's obviously got some perversion issues. And the reason why I say that is because as we read here, we'll find out. And let's pick up in verse 1. It says, in the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar. Everybody say Tamar. Tamar. The beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Let it sink for a second. Think about that. 
this boy, this man, Amnon, fell in love with his half-sister Tamar, who is Absalom. Remember what we just read about who Absalom was and what he was doing later in life. Absalom's whole sister, Amnon's half-sister. The Bible is so sweet when it's being graphic. But the bottom line is that dude is perverted and is thinking about incest or, uh, you know, mess. he's... He's lusting after his half-sister. And it overtakes him. He becomes consumed with it. First off, I think he's consumed with it because he's never been in check. Because he's a spoiled little brat that gets whatever he wants when he wants. So he puts his eyes on having it. And verse 2 says, Amnon became so frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. It seemed impossible to do anything to her. What it's saying is that dude's got all kinds of sexual issues, and he wants to do something to her. But, but since she is who he, she is and he is who he is, he can't do it. And so he's sitting there, and a friend tells him an idea. Why don't you fake being sick? And you know that Tamar cooks a mean chicken soup. And then you just call over to headquarters and say, Dad. Can you send Tamar? Oh. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, baby, that chicken soup. She's so good at the chicken soup. <coughs> and that's what he does. So Tamar comes in innocence. She's probably 16, 17. In innocence, got her favorite little chicken soup. She got her little chicken soup. Gonna bring it to my brother, his chicken soup, chicken soup. Whoop, whoop, chick, chick. What he does, he clears his mansion. He gets everybody out of the room. And let's pick up there in verse 11. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she said to him. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. If you'll skip down to the next verse 14. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. And the moment he raped her, he hated her, the Bible says. Kicked her out of the house. Now, you've got to understand Jewish culture in this time. This woman now is destroyed. No one else is going to marry her because she's damaged goods. She'll never have kids. She'll never have a place of prominence in their culture. She'll never be valued. She is damn it. He has destroyed her life, and now he's thrown her out. I won't take care of you. I don't care what I did. I don't care. I, I, I'm, I'm the little prince. I can do whatever, whatever I want. As you continue reading on, David, David's kid, David's daughter, and David's son. Talk about family drama. Word comes to David. Let's look how David responds in verse 21 of chapter 13, 2 Samuel. When David heard all of this, he was, what does it say? Furious. Read it out loud. He was? Furious. Great. So what do you think the next verses are going to be? He was furious. What do you think the next couple verses? So he called him to the kingdom, to the palace. He beat the fool out of that man, put him in jail, stripped him of his position, didn't happen. He was furious, and that's it. You can read the next few chapters. You don't find that David did a single thing. He might have been mad, but he never corrected that man. He never dealt with that man. He never, he never, that man didn't have to pay for his crime. He didn't have to pay for Tamar. And for, well, how's she going to live? She, can't, she, she doesn't have the ability. In those days, she could not go get a job. A woman was reliant upon her family, upon her husband's ability to, to, to make wealth. And then she could work under him, if you will, under his, if you were a corporation, she could do. But she could not stand on her own and do business. She's destroyed. She's broken. He doesn't have to pay for it. He doesn't have to deal with it. In fact, it doesn't even say anywhere in, this, anywhere in Scripture that David actually went and confronted Amnon on his violent crime. He doesn't get disciplined. Come on, you ever known that rich person who got out of everything? That's what this kid is. Or he's a man at this point, probably. Who knows how old he is? And he gets away with it. Absalom is her full brother. Absalom moves her into his house. And guess what? If you were Absalom, what would be happening right now inside of you? He's like, oh, yeah, okay. All right, daddy ain't going to deal with it. And for two years, Absalom pretends like it's not bothering him. And for two years, he plots how to assassinate his own brother. For two years, he plots and plans it. Everybody's kind of forgotten about it. It's just Amnon. He's just a spoiled brat. He just wrecked his Mercedes into the side of a building, didn't have to pay for it. 
You know, he just, he just stole something, you know, because he could. They got him on camera, but nobody's going to make him pay for it. He's doing, you know, little perverted takes, putting it out on the Internet. But because his dad owns all those hotels, nobody's going to do anything. Ah, sorry, I was way lost my mind. And, 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 and you, he's just getting away with it, getting away with it. And can you imagine Absalom? So at the end of two years, he calls his dad. He says, Dad, look, we've had a great year. We're, we're out in the countryside shearing all the sheep. We've made a lot of money. And what I want to do is I want to throw a banquet, Dad, for you and all the brothers. Just come out because, man, we're all blessed. God's blessing our family business, and the kingdom is just awesome. And I just want to throw a big banquet. I want, I want you to come, and I want you to bring all the, all the, all the brothers, all the sons, and, uh, and, and, and just have a big banquet. David's like, I can't come, but I'll send everyone. So all the other brothers, scores of them potentially, because he's had multiple wives. He, 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 it's not scores of them, but nonetheless, it's, it's more than one. And so all of them come. David, I mean, Absalom in the meantime has his personal bodyguards. He says, listen, Amnon's going to be here. This is the moment. I'm going to get everybody drinking. I'm going to pull out the best wine. I'm going to get the be best brewery brought, uh, you know, junk brought over, and I'm going to get them all drunk. And when he's right there in high spirits, I want you to stab him through the heart. I'm telling you what to do. I'm to blame for it. Don't you worry about it. You do what I tell you. Have courage and do what I tell you to do. It happens just like that. They're all getting drunk, and all of a sudden, they bust in the room. His bodyguards bust in the room and stab Amnon right on through the gut. Kill him right there in front of all the... All the and some of these brothers are probably 14, 15 years old, and they're all like, ah, Absalom's going to kill all the heirs to the throne so that he can be a king, the king one day. And so they all take off running. Absalom never intended that, but word, David gets a text message. Your son has lost his mind. He is killing all your other sons and probably going to kill you one day. And David's like, oh, and he starts weeping and crying. Then he gets another text message. Sorry, disregard the first one. <laughs> Absalom has killed Amnon because two years earlier he raped his, his sister and you didn't do anything about it. So he took it in his own hands. When, Amnon, when Absalom realizes, oh, dear God, I didn't just kill my brother, but now everybody thinks I'm trying to kill everybody, he takes off, and the Bible says he flees to Grandpa's house. Come on. When you're really in trouble, go to Grandma and Papa's house. They'll take care of you, and they'll love you. When nobody else loves you, Grandma will love you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he takes off, and he runs, and he flees. He's in exile. David doesn't go after him. David doesn't call him. Doesn't send him any communication. And he's out there for three years living in another country. David, meanwhile, starts longing for him. And he's sitting on his throne one day and he's just, oh man, I miss Absalom. God, that guy was amazing. Oh, I miss him. And Joab, David's right hand man, goes, David, bring him back, dude. I, you know, I don't know what David's excuse was. I, yeah, but, you know, I. I don't know. I mean, he's a murderer, bro. I don't know. He may try to kill me. You know, he's got some issues, obviously. You know, we never got him counseling like we should have. And, and, and so I don't know what David is thinking, but he, but he finally goes, okay, bring him back, but I won't look, I won't see him. I, I won't meet with him. David never meets with him. Brings the man back, puts him back in his house. I mean, listen, this man had fled. He probably took, you know, his wives, his kids, and whatever. He's living in another country. David sends for him to come back, but he won't talk to him. He won't meet with him. And for two years, that man sits in his house and never hears from his daddy. His daddy's the king. He's all over the news. I'm the king to bring a presentation again today. Welcome, friends and families. We're so excited about what's going on in Israel today. That's my dad. Turn the TV off. Day in and day out, that bitterness is steadily going. And finally, Absalom can take no more of it. And he says, listen, I need to see my dad. So he gets an appointment with his dad. He has to set the appointment. He has to set a man's field on fire to get the attention of the palace so that he could try to go get a meeting with his dad. He comes into the meeting with his dad. He falls down on his face. And the Bible says David kissed him. That's it. They didn't have counseling. They didn't talk about it. He didn't say, son, what's, what's going on in you, buddy, that you would be so crazy to kill so that he could then say, what's wrong with you? That you never took care of the thing you should have been taking care of. You let that man rape your own daughter and never dealt with him. This bitterness is stirring in him and stirring in him. Never has a confrontation. David never deals with it. 
won't deal. I don't know why. The Bible's not clear on that. But I guess you would almost call this somewhat of a restoration, even though there was no clear confrontation, there was no clear resolve. They just, he kissed him, and that's the end of it. And then we find out for the next few years that Absalom does something pretty treacherous. And let's pick up there in 2 Samuel Verse 15, chapter 15, verse 2. It says, he would get up early, and he'd stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. And whenever anyone would come with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call to him, what town are you from? And he would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land. This dude would stand out. So the city gate was where they did all of, kind of, at the city gate, it's where they would do all of their, um, kind of their governmental pieces. And you would come and complain because you lived out, you know, out, out in the countryside. And, and this guy just stole your wife or this guy, you know, just did something. And, and there's no real, you know, authority out there. So you'd come in and complain and they'd make a decision. And if it was big enough, it'd make it up to the king. And so he's standing just to, he's standing out in front of the courthouse. Hey, man, what you here for? Man, dude, you're not going to believe. Aren't you the prince? Yeah, yeah, I am. What's going on? Man, this happened, this happened. Well, look, let me just tell you something, bro. King David don't care if lions look. Ain't nobody going to help you in this. I'm going to just tell you right now. As the prince, tell me what you, yeah, dude, that ain't right. That shouldn't be happening. I'll tell you what, you go back and you tell them if they don't, if they don't change that and give you the money that they owe you, then I'm going to show up with my, with my little group of uh, you know, assassins and we're going to take them out. Man, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, here, let me just put my little ring stamp on that little piece of paper for you. Yeah, listen, you, if only I was king, because I'm going to tell you right now, he ain't going to do nothing for you. I, you know, he's old. He don't, and you know what he did? You know, he didn't even deal with the fact that, that I've got to take care of Tamar, you know, that Amnon raped her. And, you know, I, I, how did I end up the bad guy when really somebody should have dealt with it? I just did what needed to be done. You're right. That's true. Sometimes you just got to do something right. That's right. I just did what, what the Bible says, eye for an eye, two for two. That's, I just did that. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. He's standing there day in and day out. Can I ask you a question? How does David not know about this? If somebody stood out in front of your front yard and told everybody, D don't go to their house, they prejudice. Don't go to their house, they don't, they don't care about you. If somebody stood out in front of our church and said, oh, man, they lie, they don't love you. Do you think I wouldn't know about it? <laughs> David knew about it, but he wouldn't deal with it. I'm sure they would come to, hey, hey, king, uh, hey, your son? Dude, he's out there like just so in such dissension. And I'm sure his response was like, man, I know. That dude's got some issues, man. I mean, his mom was kind of crazy too. I mean, I don't know what we're going to do. I, and, you know, I probably should have done something with him years ago. But, you know, I just, I'm just hoping something happens. Day in and day out, he let that man sit there. Till finally that man said, hey, you're a prophet. I think I should be the next king. Don't you hear God saying that? Yes, yes, he's saying that. Hey, aren't you tired of the old regime? It's not doing anything. We're not getting any better financially. We got more problems than we ever had. I think it's time for me to be king. Yeah, you're right. Till he finally generates enough support that he gets him his own little army going. And he gets the, a, a person to prophesy over him and be the prophet to say this is God's will. And he gets a bunch of David's closest leaders. He covertly gets them to come over to his side. And they start making this plan. And they go out and they put this plan into full effect. And when we first read, what happened was he's charging onto the city. David gets wind of it before he gets there. He flees the city. And if you'll keep reading out, what happens is as David flees, uh, 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 Absalom comes into the city. It's abandoned because his dad took off with anybody that would follow him. And he's here. And so he sets himself up as the king of Israel. And, and one of his counselors says, chase after him now. If you let him get comfortable, his, he, he, he's going to mount a, a, another attack against you, Absalom, and you won't, be able to hold, you won't be able to hold the fort. And another counselor says, no, listen, I think you better not attack him right now. You better give, him, better give it till tomorrow till you can get all your troops set. And you know his troops, you know, they, you don't want to treat them like a wounded bear. You, wanna, you want them to kind of lull a little bit and think it's okay, and then tomorrow we'll go out and get them. And he believed that counsel, and so David's guys kind of came around him and his family, and the Bible says that they went and they did a battle, and the, and the battle raged in the woods of Ephraim. And what happens is, is that David's dudes are old and skilled, but Absalom's got as much young dudes they ain't never been, been in battle before. And so even though he had more troops and these guys, once they get out in this wooded area, a little different terrain, it's not open battlefield, David's guys kill them all. I mean, they're just slaughtering them and kill them. And, and Absalom realized, 
OMG, I am done. And he takes off on his horse, on his mule. He takes off. And he's got this big, beautiful locks of hair. And it's probably dark black because he's Israeli. And I mean, and it's just flowing in the wind, you know, like, a, like one of those, you know, uh, men's spritz commercials, you know. And it's flowing in the wind, you know. And the Bible says as he's running through this wooded area on, trying to escape, that his hair, his head gets caught in the limbs of a tree. <laughs> and that, and that, that donkey keeps on running. Now, they're chasing after him, so they come, and he's standing there. Hanging from a tree. Uh, uh. The Bible says that Joab takes spears and sticks him through. Wow. How does the father of peace become the man hanging in a tree who's tried to kill his own dad, split the kingdom away from him, a man of bitterness and hatred? How does it get to that? Can you imagine? Can you imagine being Absalom? He thought he did the right thing. He thought. He thought he had chosen the right way because, because David was wrong. David didn't do what he was supposed to do in the time that he was supposed He's even got people prophesying it's God's will. He's even got people who've been David's closest advisors on his team. And he's hanging there as they stick this first spear through. And can, can you imagine the horror of revelation? I've not been doing it right. I was wrong. It's from that premise that you and I need to probably awaken a little bit. And just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean it's the right way. And just because things are shifting on what a family is in culture, what we've got to figure out is what's the right way. Because we can be just a little bit off and have crazy end results. David thought, if I'll just let it go, and I'll let it go. And he let it go with Amnon. He let it go with Absalom. And can I tell you something? To David's horror... They give him the report, Absalom's been killed, and all the enemies of David have been routed. And the Bible says he begins to weep. Oh, my poor son Absalom. Oh, my poor son Absalom. To where his general, Joab, comes in and says, what are you doing? Are you out of your mind? These men have fought for you when no one else stood for you, and they're marching back into the city, and you're standing at the gate. Oh, oh poor Absalom, the man who tried to kill you. You better tighten yourself up and stand there in front of him and say, thank you for laying your life down for me. Why was David in he's such confusion on what's the right way? Because he let a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, he didn't deal with the problems at hand. And so he finds himself 20, 30 years later in a position he should have never been in. And I want to say to us today, we need to see the future. If you keep doing what you're doing, what will happen 20, 30 years from now? If you keep letting slide what you're letting slide now, what will that child be like 30 years from now? If you keep, as a single person, doing what you're doing now, what will that look like five years from now when you are married? Yep. What we decide today, what we do today, determines the future. We need to have eyes to see what's going I promise you, if 40, 50 years earlier, as David was looking down into that crib, if he'd have thought for a moment, this kid one day is going to try to kill me, he'd have done things different. Yep. I, I think if David could have just had enough insight at the moment... That Amnon raped Tamar to be able to say, whoa, whoa, we got some family problems. Everybody, let's go. Counseling right now. Right now. What he didn't deal with with Amnon spilled over into Absalom. And he didn't deal with it with Absalom. And he didn't deal with it with Absalom's next show, show, showing of his butt. And he didn't deal with the next thing. He just let it slide. And I'm sure he was praying, oh God, oh God, make it better. Because he didn't deal with it. Indecisiveness. Not dealing with something is dealing with something. Because here he is 20 years later, and this man is trying to kill him. And now he's having to stand in front of his own men, embarrassed of his humiliation that he wasn't a good dad. Embarrassed of what this man has done, that he's assassinated his own brother. He's molested David's concubines. He has become a man of bitterness and hatred and tried to destroy the nation that had finally had peace all because of something stirring inside of him that David could have fixed. I want to show you this little trajectory concept. So here we are. If this white line, we'll use it as the base of what is right. The Bible says, there's a, the, the Bible says that narrow is the road that leads to life. Few therein. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. The Bible also says there's a way that seems right to a man, 
but the end thereof is death. So you imagine the Christian who starts down this pathway and thinking, this is the right way to raise my family, this is the right way to be a, a, a man of God, and just getting off by 1%, 2%, where that little line is close to that white line, getting off by 1% or 2%, look what the end trajectory is at the end of it all. Nowhere close to where it was supposed to be. They say when flying an airplane, what happens is those, they, they put in the end destination, but those wind currents bounce you off of track. And so what has to happen is you'll get off 1%, I mean just 1%, and you'll end up in another continent thousands of miles later. And that there has to be constantly course corrections and has to constantly be changed today more than ever before. You and I have to have eyes to see the future. What is coming? What is going to happen? If you, if you keep doing what you're doing, if you don't do what you need to do, what will, that, what will that mean for your grandkids? What will that mean for your marriage? If you don't make adjustments now, if we don't see it now, what will be the end result? I promise you, if King David was standing here right now, he would say to you, do it, change. Because his heart was broken over the death of his own son. And he's lost a son to murder. Now he's lost a son to rebellion. He's got a damaged goods daughter. You talk about family drama. So with that being said, let me give you a couple thoughts as I see from this family and from the scriptures on how we can save the future family. How we can save, you're a single person, how we can save your future family. What are some thoughts that you and I can take from this? Number one, we need to commit to learn and to live the right way. To learn and to live the right way. The right way. The Bible way. I had this couple years ago at Church on the Hill. The first star is so sweet. They fell in love with Jesus. They, were, they loved God. And they lived together, but they weren't married. And they were the sweetest people in the world. They had kids together. It was their kids, but he wouldn't marry her. And I kept asking, why won't you marry her? Why won't you make that commitment to her? And she wanted him to marry her. He said, well, because we're able to claim her as a single mom, and she's able to get discounts and government funding as a result of it. So you're robbing the government. See, remember our trajectory? 1% off and the end thereof. Like, what will that teach your children 30 years from now? Yep. Who will they be stealing from because you won't do what's right? I, I have stories after stories of good, sweet people who had good reasoning for what they were doing or what they weren't doing. And, and it came down to the fact that they didn't have a Bible-based center point to even know what is the right way. Again, Proverbs, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. Yep. It seems right. But, yeah, you're right. That's, that's, that's true. That's right. But the Bible says it's not right. Yeah, but, but, but everybody else in culture says it is. Again, one degree off. Where will we be 30 years from now, 50 years from now? Where will our children be? What will be their concepts? What will be, how will they raise their children's children's children? We've got to come back to the baseline. So we have to learn and live the right way. What, how should I treat my spouse? What's the right way? Not what does everybody else do. How should I treat my kids? How, how should me, as, as, a, as a young person, treat my mom and dad? What is the right way? Not what, is it, what does everybody else do? I'm constantly helping my children find the right way. And they're constantly helping me be a good dad. But we have to find the right way and live therein. Here's the second thing I would teach you, and that is we have to identify personal weakness and deal with them now. Identify personal weaknesses and deal with them now. David had a weakness. For whatever reason, this man was so this man was so aggressive with everything but his family. He, for whatever reason, he was passive when it came to his family. I don't know if he felt guilty because he was always doing king stuff and, and so he didn't have a lot of time with them. So when he finally was with them, he didn't want to spank them or discipline them or whatever the case may be. I don't know if he, he had shame still from the fact that he, he, had, uh, he had, you know, basically had an adulterous affair with a woman and then had her husband killed. I don't know if it was that, and so he felt like, well, I don't have a right to correct my own kids, you know, because, I, look, I, I'm, I'm a sinner, too, and I, I'm, I'm messed up, too. I don't know what the reason was, but he had some clear weaknesses that he would not deal with, and those weaknesses destroyed his family. There's a sweet gal in something I was ministering at some time back, she, big venue, wasn't Church on the Hill, and she came up to me, and she said, uh, she said, I, I need some advice. I said, sure. She goes, my dad's a pastor. I said, okay. And she said, um, she said last year, um, he basically got caught looking at porn 
and the church, you know, took him through some restoration and stuff, and, um, and, uh, and, and they, you know, they let him stay as the pastor. She goes, um, but my sister and I, last week, uh, was looking on his phone, and, and he obviously didn't know how to clear it out, but we found that he's back looking at porn. What do I do? So here's this young adult. Her, her father's own weaknesses. She knows if I bring this out, he'll probably lose his job. He'll be humiliated. Whatever depression, frustration he's dealing with now, the stress that's causing him to do this, because my dad's not that good. My dad's a good guy. But guess what she now has to carry? Is my husband going to do this? Look at the weakness, what it's created for this young lady. Guys, we all are sinners saved by grace. We all have weaknesses. But what we have to do is identify them and deal with them. David should have said, look, I'm a terrible at confronting you guys, and I don't even know what to do. You mean to tell me he's the king of Israel, and there's not one counselor in the whole place that he can go meet with? It won't cost him nothing. He's the king. You mean to tell me there's not a life coach that can help him be a better dad, that he can go say, look, man, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I've got my, 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 my oldest son just raped, raped my, my daughter, and I don't know what to do. I want to murder him. I'm so mad. I'm so mad, but I don't know what's the right. You mean to tell me he couldn't find some help, but, but he couldn't identify that he had a weakness. He wanted to pretend like he had it together. He's the king. He's the all-knowing, all-seeing king. Friend, none of us have it together. We all need this series. We all need it. We all need to know, God, what do you have to say in the word? What, what are my weaknesses doing that are hurting my family, that are going to hurt? Again, where is this thing going to end out? If my weakness continues to dominate my family, where is this thing going to end out years from now? We uh, looked up first of the year. <laughs> we were real busy, you know. Uh, I've got, you know, uh, my son, Cohen, you guys know, he, he runs our youth ministry, great man of God. And uh, he's, in, he's in school. He has his own place that he lives. And then I've got my 17-year-old daughter, about to turn 18. She's a senior in high school, graduating with 70 credit hours, going straight into it as a junior into college. Super busy. Super, both of those, my children are so busy. And then i got an 11-year-old. And she just does whatever we tell her because, you know, she's, she's in fifth grade. So I looked up, and, man, we hadn't had dinner together. I mean... Like, they never get to talk to Dad. We're texting and seeing each other at meetings at the church and passing by each other at the house. And I just realized, man, if, if that's a weakness of mine not to say, hey, I'd like to have dinner with you. I'd like us to sit down. So I asked him, I said, would, would, you, guys, would you guys be willing to take Monday nights and just come to the house and, and have dinner with us? And I just need to see you. I don't want to, busy, I don't want to bother them because they're doing so many great things for Jesus. But I realized if I don't do something now, we won't have a relationship three years from now. If I don't, I mean, my kids are magnificent. They love Jesus, and it's because their mama's amazing, I'm telling you now. But at the end of the day, I need to do something now. I need to recognize that's a weakness in me to just let them run and not say, hey, I need you, and you need me. Let's call, carve out a time. That brings me to my third point that I think we can learn from David today, and that is courage. We need courage to make course corrections. We need courage to make course corrections. I told you last week that as we go into the series, that I didn't believe I was smart enough to help us all. So I've been drawing from Dr. James Dobson, who's in his 80s, and who is the guru when it comes to family and ministry and Jesus and Christianity and how the family can line up with the Word of God and just coaching us. And I found him teaching on a little course correction, and I wanted to play this little clip from his, from his ministry for just a second. In the official magazine of the Naval Institute, Frank Cope reported on a very unusual encounter at sea. A battleship was coming in for maneuvers in heavy weather. Shortly after the sun went down, the lookout reported a light in the distance. So the captain had the signalman send a message. We're on a collision course. Advise you change your course 20 degrees. Well, minutes later, a signal came back. Advisable for you to change your course. Well, the captain angrily ordered that another signal be sent. I am a captain. Change course 20 degrees. Again came the reply. I'm a seaman second class. You better change your course. Furious by this point, the captain barked a final threat. I'm a battleship. Change your course. The signal came back. I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> the captain changed his course. I don't care how big and powerful a person may become. It's foolhardy to ignore the beacons that warn us of danger. 
They take various forms, symptoms of health problems, prolonged marital conflict, rebellious children, excessive debt, stress that ties us in knots. These are the warning signs of approaching danger. It matters not that we're successful and influential and busy. A little seaman second class sits in a lighthouse somewhere and signals, change of course. And the wise captain does so with haste. Today, I'm your little seaman second class telling you we all need to change some courses. That same imagery that I gave you on trajectory, let me show you what happens when we take and we change our course. We may have gotten off. You don't even realize it. You know, you and your wife don't even really talk anymore. Uh, you, you don't even know how to even engage intimacy anymore. And, and that may be heading in a really bad direction, but you and I have the ability to change courses. You have, within your power, an opportunity. I guarantee you, if David would have woke up and went over to Amnon's house, said, I hear that you're lusting after your sister. Bro, that's not going to happen. You touch her, you're dead. If he would have, after he did what he did, he had another opportunity to change the course of his family. He could have stood up and said, Amnon, I love you, buddy. But like everybody else, you got to be disciplined. You're going to jail for the amount of time that anyone who has done this has to go to jail. You will, not only will you go to jail, but when you get out of jail, all of your authority is stripped from you. And you're going to work in the fields watching sheep, just like I had to do as a young man. Because you obviously are so spoiled that you have no regard for other people and what they're going through. And not only that, but with whatever money you bring in, you're going to support your sister Tamar for the rest of her life. She will not live with you, but you're going to send money to feed her and to clothe her and take care of her all of her days. He didn't make that course correction. He had a moment. It would, it, would, it would have fixed everything. Then the moment that Absalom threw that party, that he couldn't see the anger and the hatred and the bitterness in, in that boy's eyes. You know he felt it. You know he had thought that over the years, over those two-year periods, never made the course correction. When that moment, after Absalom did what he did and killed his brother, David should have got his army together, went to Grandpa's house. Y'all stand out here in case I need y'all, yell at you. Knocked on the door and said, Grandpa, step aside. I need, to talk to, I need to talk to Absalom. They should have sat at the table weeping, saying, son, what did you do? Why'd you do that? Because you didn't do what you were supposed to. I know. I failed you. I failed Israel. I failed our family. But well, let's make a course correction. Now, you got to pay for what you did, buddy. You're going to have to spend some time. And yet we can't let everyone in the nation see that you can just go kill anybody you want to kill just because they, they did wrong. There's a court system for this. And yes, you know what I'll do? I'll make a decree. And I'll step down as king if I have to. Because I'm not going to let this family be destroyed. I blew it. I should have done better. I failed you, son. And I'm so sorry. But you've got you to pay, your, pay the piper, and I've got to pay it as well. Should have made the course correction right there. And he wouldn't have been looking at 20 years down to 10, 15 years down the road, this man trying to kill him. Once he did bring him finally back, he should have met with that young man. Another opportunity to make a course correction. Moment after moment that he did make a course correction, you have the ability to make course correction. It's not too far. I don't care if your 17-year-old goes, I can't stand you, I hate you. You have an opportunity to make a course correction now. You've you got to think about, not now, you've got to think about 20 years from now. What will you do now to make a course correction? I had, had this family come to me, and their teenage daughter had gotten pregnant. They were so mad. They had warned her. They, she kept slipping out with this boy, and this dad wanted to kill this boy. He was older, and they kept telling him, if you come around my daughter, I'll kill you. But they couldn't stop what's inside of her, wanting to be rebellious and go hang out with this boy. She gets pregnant, and they take the door off her. They're going to kick her out of the home. And I said to them, and they're going to, th th their plan was, they sat with me, their plan was to literally remove her from their family. And I I said to them, I said, wake up. I said, that little girl's going to give birth to that baby. That's your grandbaby. That's your grandbaby. That grandbaby's going to grow up talking about grandma and papa so-and-so who they've never seen, who are Christians, but hate this baby. This baby's going to have no idea why, they're, why it's hated. Because you can't make a course correction. You've been hard. You've, been, you, you, you've not been relational with this daughter. And you've made mistakes. And yes, she's bitter. And yes, she needs, she needs some help. And yes, she needs to repent. And yes, she's made your life miserable. But now's the time to make a course correction because this little grandbaby is going to come on the scene. And that grandbaby needs to know that there's a grandparent that loves them and that there's always a godly person in that, in that family line that this kid can go back to. Even if your daughter never serves God and she goes and becomes a Satanist, all you, uh, that grandbaby 
creator. You need to see past today and see the trajectory and the future. See the future and where it's going and have the wisdom to know what you should do. And they went, you're right. So they were there for the birth of that child. They loved, and guess what? That daughter came back to Jesus, fell back in love with her parents because they made some course corrections. And that child, that grandbaby, though living with a single mom, that grandbaby is being raised in a Christian home, in a Christian environment, because that, that, that parents had enough sense to make a course correction. When Jamie and I were first married, I didn't make a lot of money. I was an assistant youth pastor at a mega church. They paid me $800 a month. After I tithed, I was, and, and they took taxes out of it, I was down to like $500 a month to live on. Then I lived in their apartment on the property that they charged me $350 a month. So once I paid my $50 pager bill, I wasn't left with about, I think we had about $100 to eat on. And so, and so, you know, we got married, Jamie's working too, and then we decided we need to get off the property and get our own little house. So we found this little house, real cheap, we're going to buy it, and we bought this house. with. I, I still can't believe they gave us a loan for it. And man, we were living, I mean, literally the little ladies at the food pantry would set us out a bag every day because they knew we were so broke. And here we are, little, little youth pastors at, at, at a big mega church. And, 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 and now Jamie had, her mom and dad were magnificent. They're magnificent givers. They're the sweetest people on the planet. And at that season of life, their businesses were doing really good. Uh, Mr. Danny is an attorney, uh, and, and, and KK, she, she has her own computer company, and they were making good money. And Jamie's an only child, so right up until the year I marry her, she had the family credit card. she go buy what she wants, when she wants to, how she wants to. And so she never thought twice about it. Well, here we are, probably first year of marriage, maybe second year, and, uh, and we get that house, and, man, we don't have money for anything. And I come home one day, and there's new carpet in the living room. I said, where did this come from? She goes, oh, I just put it, I put it on Mom and Dad's credit card, so we got new carpet. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. And in that moment, it hit me. 20 years from now, 20 years from now, her mom and daddy will be financing me if something doesn't course correct right now. And I set her down. I said, I know you didn't do anything wrong. And they are just so sweet. They're like, yeah, baby, go get some carpet for your new house. We're so excited for you. They're just such good givers. No one did anything wrong, but the direction is wrong. Because I'm supposed to be the provider for my family, not the grandparents. I'm supposed to leave and cleave. I'm supposed to take care of my own wife. She needs to be able to look confidently in my eyes and say, my, my man's got me. My man's got my, he's got, he's going to take care of our family. We can have kids because he's going to do whatever he's got to do to make sure there's food on the table and a roof over our head. And they can't, that can't come from grandparents. And so I set her down. I said, I love you with all your heart, all my heart, but we're not going to do that anymore, okay? In fact, can I have that credit card? And then I went, and I went over to KK and Pawpaw's house, and I said, listen, I love you. You are so gracious and so sweet, and I don't mean to offend you, but I, I, I'm going to ask you, don't, don't, don't buy it anymore. I have to provide for my wife. Because if I don't, 20 years from now, I'm going to be living in your garage because you're going to neuter me. And I won't, I won't, ha I won't have the, the guts to fight through the hardship because you always bail me out. And that's not going to make for a strong marriage and won't make me a, the man of God that I'm supposed to be. And yes, I'm in ministry and that's, I'm sorry, that's what your daughter married into. So we eat Roman noodles and we're going we gonna, we gonna, we gonna to have an old beat up house but we're going to love each other, and God's going to bless us, and God's going to do miracles, and I'm going to have faith for it. I'm going to work my brains out. And they said, okay. They were so gracious with me. And I'm telling you what, God has always provided. But in that moment, I had to make a course correction. I had enough sense to see if we keep doing this 20 years from now, 30 years from now, they're going to be my provider instead of he, he being my provider. I'm going to end up a deadbeat just simply because why wouldn't I? They, they got money. They, I'm, I'm a minister. I'm a minister. They need to give me money, bless God. And I figured it out in that moment. I wasn't that smart, but I heard God's voice, and I made a course correction. And I really believe that I've been able to provide for my family the way I have because of that moment back some 24 years ago.